The seven deadly sins are wrath, envy, gluttony, greed, pride, lust, and sloth. Which Star Wars characters exemplify these sins the most? Let's find out, starting with wrath. Wrath, also known as anger, manifests itself in individuals who spurn love and opt instead for feelings of hatred and fury with a strong desire for vengeance. There's no character in Star Wars that embodies this sin better than Anakin Skywalker. But how did Anakin's wrath take hold of him so quickly, which would cause him to fall to the dark side? Well, we first see Anakin give in to his anger when he has a dream that his mother was in danger. He went to Tatooine to investigate. It turns out that she was kidnapped by Tusken Raiders. Anakin sneaks into the Tusken Raider village, only to find his mother barely clinging to life. There's nothing Anakin can do, and Shmi dies in his arms. He gives in to his wrath and slaughters the entire village. All of them were murdered, men, women, and children. It's at this very moment that Anakin realizes he can't control things to save others. When he begins to dream of Padme's death, then, desperation starts to set in. What can he do to save her? The Jedi continue to tell Anakin that he must let go of his emotions and attachments. But, you see, because he was taken away from his mother at the age of nine years old, which was much older than most Force-sensitive children, he still held that familial attachment to her. I miss her. He couldn't let go of that. The Jedi, in his point of view, kept him away from her, which caused her death. And now, events were repeating themselves with Padme. Letting go wasn't an option for him, but Palpatine, as a friend and a mentor, offered a different path. Good is just a point of view, after all. When it came down to it, he knew he couldn't kill Sidious, because Sidious was the only one that had the way to save Padme. Anakin couldn't bear to go through the pain of losing someone close to him again, and so he gave in to his wrath once more. By kneeling and submitting himself as Sidious' apprentice, he fully turned to the dark side. He became Darth Vader, who is wrath itself. Just like Anakin, this next character had things happen to him that he couldn't control. But instead of attempting to suppress his sin, envy, he allowed it to define him. Envy is an extreme kind of jealousy where one has an obsessive desire for someone else's status, abilities, or situation. The character that embodies this sin is Darth Maul. Maul is a tragic story. After his defeat at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Maul was thought dead by the Jedi. Unbeknownst to everyone, he was clinging to life. Finally, he was saved and reborn on Dathomir, but he was a shell of his former self. Maul had lost everything, his position, status, and power. He was cast aside by Sidious and replaced by Lord Tyrannus. Maul was envious of Dooku, but also of the Sith and their power. Kenobi took all of these opportunities away from Maul, and since Maul knew he had little chance of getting them back for himself, he chose to take what he could from Obi-Wan in his envy. Kenobi! He wanted nothing more than to torture Obi-Wan and see him suffer just as he did. Maul let his envy consume him entirely, as he went to extreme lengths, such as taking the entire world of Mandalore, just so he could lure Kenobi out in the open, only to murder Obi-Wan's love, Duchess Satine. You see, Maul envied Obi-Wan because Obi-Wan had everything Maul could have ever wanted. Obi-Wan had love in Duchess Satine, a brotherhood in the Jedi Order, and he had a brother and an apprentice in Anakin Skywalker. Maul desperately wanted an apprentice, someone he could pass his knowledge on to, who could carry on his legacy. In this way, he envied Sidious's role as master. We see this in Maul's training of Savage, but Sidious took that from him too. Maul himself said, The Sith took everything from me, ripped me from my mother's arms, murdered my brother, used me as a weapon, and then cast me aside, abandoned me. I had power, now I have nothing. Maul had already been taken from his mother at birth. Then, Sidious abandoned him, who was the closest thing Maul had to a father figure. And as if that wasn't enough, Sidious murdered Maul's brother and apprentice Salah. Maul had nothing left, all taken away at the hands of Darth Sidious. Which is no surprise considering Darth Sidious is the person who embodies our next sin, gluttony. Gluttony is an inordinate desire to consume more than that which one requires. Typically, we think of gluttony as referring to a literal overconsumption of food, but this sin can also refer to the inordinate desire to gain power or overindulgence in material goods that is far beyond what one person needs. While Sidious could easily be a candidate for all the seven deadly sins, since he quite literally embodies evil itself, there's no denying that he has a special taste for power. It all started when Sidious murdered his old master, Darth Plagueis. Palpatine craved more power than just being someone's apprentice. He wanted to be the master. But being the most powerful Dark Lord of the Sith wasn't enough either. 
So he set his plan into motion. He constructed the Naboo Crisis just to get himself the role of Supreme Chancellor of the Republic with no regard to the cost of life. And then he contrived the threat of a pending separatist invasion using his apprentice, Count Dooku. The entire Clone War was orchestrated to eliminate the Jedi. With the completion of Order 66, nothing stood in Sidious' way of galactic domination. He had control of the Force, politics, and the entire galactic economy. But even this wasn't enough. Sidious didn't just want to be in control of the entire galaxy. He wanted complete dominance. He wanted all of his subjects to grovel, living in constant fear. His plan? Build the Death Star. A project of this scale stripped entire planets of their resources. The labor required to build it enslaved millions. The sheer cost of the credits needed collapsed entire banking sectors. This is gluttony at its finest. And even after its destruction, Sidious went ahead and tried to build a second Death Star. Thankfully for the rest of the galaxy, Sidious had an untimely death at the hands of Darth Vader. But Sidious's gluttony didn't stop there. Palpatine planned to explore and invade the unknown regions once he was through with the rebellion. He was fascinated by Grand Admiral Thrawn and his people, the Chiss. Sidious wasn't satisfied with ruling the known galaxy, he wanted domination over everything that existed. But this wouldn't be possible in a normal human's lifetime, which is why in his gluttony, he planned to achieve immortality. Sidious wished for more life than was possible for a normal human being. He invested billions of credits into cloning technology at Mount Tantus. His plan was, at the time of his death, his spirit would go to inhabit one of these clones. In this way, he could live indefinitely. And this plan ended up working. Palpatine was resurrected once again, and using his puppet Snoke, he nearly succeeded in dominating the galaxy. You might be thinking that Palpatine seems to exemplify greed more than gluttony. However, greed is defined as the desire for material wealth or gain, completely ignoring the realm of the spiritual. Palpatine definitely didn't ignore spirituality, as he was one of the most powerful force-sensitive beings of all time. But one of Sidious's pawns that set his plan into motion does embody greed perfectly. And that person is Newt Gunray of the Trade Federation. The Trade Federation was known as one of the wealthiest, most cutthroat business enterprises in the galaxy. And naturally, the company embodied the traits of its leader. The Trade Federation already had a monopoly on hyperspace shipping lanes, particularly in the mid rim The Republic saw this monopoly, and its senators voted on a new bill which would impose a tax on these shipping lanes. New Gunray thought this would be too costly for the Federation. It would take a small chunk from their already soaring profit margins. However, Nemoidians are master tacticians, often cowardly at heart. New Gunray didn't see a logical way out for the Federation, until Darth Sidious gave him a solution. Blockade Naboo. My lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. To the Republic, it seemed like an extremely irrational move by the Federation. They would almost certainly lose, and lose their trade license and presumably much of their profits in the process. Kiss your trade franchise goodbye. But in his greed, Newt Gunray believed in what Palpatine had to say. By blockading the planet, he would dissuade the weak and bureaucratic Senate from taxing his trade routes. So, he carried through with the plot. Simply on account of greed, he starved and killed thousands of Naboo citizens in concentration camps. All because Newt Gunray wanted to force the Queen of Naboo into signing a treaty, making their occupation legal. Even after this scheme failed, Newt Gunray still stood to profit by making the Trade Federation part of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Newt Gunray realized the Federation had passed the point of no return. It could never go back to the way things were under his leadership. So instead, he opted to join in in an all-out galactic conflict. The Republic wants to tax us? Let's destroy the Republic. War is a big business, after all. And Newt Gunray did all of this on account of sheer greed and paid with his life. Another man who was a pawn of Darth Sidious embodies our next sin, which is pride. Pride is an excessive belief in one's own abilities and achievements. It has been called the sin from which all others arise, and the most deadly of all the sin. The man that exemplifies pride the most is Imperial Director Orson Krennic. Krennic was the Director of Advanced Weapons Research for the Imperial Military, a prestigious and important position one that he took much pride in because of the status and power that came with it. He achieved this position because of his lofty aspirations and ambitions. He took pride in his own ability, which he made sure to make known to all of his superiors, granting him promotions through the Imperial you ranks. Tell the Emperor, no. But suddenly, Krennic became infinitely more important when he took charge of the monumental Stardust Project, the code name for the construction of the Death Star. Krennic was now one of the single most vitally important and influential individuals in the entire Empire and he knew it. 
Upon the Death Star's completion and its initial testing, we see Krennic's immense pride as he attempts to take all of the credit. <laughs> we stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! Never mind the countless engineers like Galen Urso that planned the actual project, or the millions of workers and droids it took to build the thing. It was all about him. This was Krennic's achievement. Krennic's pride was so vast that even Lord Vader took notice when he summoned Krennic to Mustafar. Vader had intended to speak to Krennic to make sure that the Death Star would be kept a secret, but Krennic had no respect for the Dark Lord initially. In his pride of his recent achievement, he only wanted to make sure the Emperor was aware of his accomplishment, so that Krennic would be promoted and exalted. After all, a man of his caliber and brilliance only deserved such praise. Or, that's how Krennic saw it. Vader saw right through Krennic's prideful facade and put him in his place. Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. Krennic wasn't careful not to choke on his aspiration and pride. He let his pride consume and control his every action, which is what led to his end by the hand of his own superweapon. Another character that literally died from choking is Jabba the Hutt, who is the character that embodies lust. Lust is an inordinate craving for the pleasures of the body, specifically sexual desires. When you look at Jabba's lifestyle, you can see lust in everything he does. Jabba kept various female slaves in his palace, for his rabble and for himself. This mainly included scantily dressed Twi'leks and eventually Princess Leia Organa herself. It turns out Jabba had a serious fetish for humans. Some of these slaves were presumably concubines and prostitutes for Jabba himself and his cronies and some were dancers as a source of entertainment in the palace. Part of this wasn't strictly sexual in nature, though. It was also about Jabba's lust for power. Humiliating these slaves was a projection of his dominance. It was an impressive show of control for his numerous bounty hunters and associates to show that Jabba could possess and humiliate the most beautiful women in the galaxy just for the sake of it. Jabba also enjoyed this humiliation process, which is yet another of his sick fetishes. We see a progression of this with Leia. In one scene, Leia tells Jabba how detestable he is, and how she'll never give in to him. And then, the next time we see her, she's dressed in a golden bikini, chained to Jabba. Then, Jabba tries to execute her closest friends and love interests in front of her. Enjoying the spectacle of watching her in obvious agony, he repeatedly pulls her toward him with a chain, so she can't see the action. And if his slaves ever cross the line in this humiliation process, as we see with the like Ula, he could just feed them to one of his powerful creatures, like the Rancor or the Sarlacc. Jabba also heavily indulged in other bodily pleasures, such as eating creatures alive, or dabbling in spice and other drugs and hallucinogens. And of course, Jabba lusted after money the most. Jabba could have easily dismissed minor debts that people owed to him, like Han Solo. When a man like Han had debts to be paid to Jabba, Jabba made sure that all of Hut's face and his bounty hunters were aware of it. We clearly see from Han's mannerisms toward the situation that he knew there was no escaping his debt with Jabba. That plus a little extra. I just need a little more time. He would pay the money and interest back to Jabba in full, or he would pay with his life. And the same is true for countless others that did business with the Crime Lord. Once captured, they were brought before him in his palace on Tatooine. Because, of course, Jabba can't really move. So you might think he'd be a good candidate for our last sin, which is sloth. Sloth is the avoidance of physical or spiritual work. It's similar to laziness, or the lack of putting forth appropriate efforts. Jabba still gets a lot done, even from his mostly sedentary lifestyle. The character that embodies sloth the most, actually, is Luke Skywalker. I know what you're thinking. How could an incredible Jedi Master like Luke represent one of the seven deadly sins? Well, nobody is perfect. We all have flaws. And Luke's flaws come out more pointedly than most. You see, for starters, Luke was slothful in his failure of training Ben Solo. Luke didn't dedicate enough of his time and resources to his relationship with Ben and the rest of his apprentices. Because of this, when Luke had a vision of Ben Solo destroying the New Jedi Order, Luke made the wrong decision. Rather than face the confrontation head on and talk to Ben, Luke opted to try to murder Ben because that was the easy way out. His sloth got the better of him. And then, even after all of that, Luke still had an opportunity to work alongside Leia and Han to try to make things right, to quash the coming darkness. Instead of taking responsibility for his actions and trying to make things right, he exiled himself and decided to hide away from the conflict. Once again, he took the easy way out. 
He could have put in the work, physically and spiritually through the Force, to win Ben back the light, or to confront the darkness head-on in the looming conflict. Even after Rey comes to the island to try to convince him to come back, Luke still doesn't budge. This pattern of avoidance in Luke is a clear indicator of sloth controlling his life.